Chapter 17 Well, finally I had to go home. I was having a neat time in Washington, but Mr. Jenkins had said I could only stay out of school four weeks, and my time was up. I went down to the zoo to see Uncle Feasley for the last time, and I scratched his neck with a rake the way he likes, and I said goodbye to him, but he probably didn't understand what I meant. He was getting to be awful big, but he was still gentle and friendly with me. Mr. Holmquist said that they'd take specially good care of him, and Dr. Zymer said he would send me a bulletin every week about how Uncle Beasley was getting along. I was glad to have him in such good hands. Dr. Zymer said goodbye to me at the station. Just before the train left, he gave me a fossil dinosaur egg in a special wooden box just to fit it. All of us at the museum thought you ought to have this to keep, he said, in return for what you've done for us and all the other scientists all over the world. Now, goodbye, Nate, and be sure to come back and see us again, won't you? You bet, I said, and and thanks ever so much, Dr. Zymer. But then the train started, and all I could do was wave to him until he was out of sight. When the train pulled into Ashland, New Hampshire, there was Pop and Mom, and Cynthia waiting at the station. When I stepped off the train, they all hugged me at once, even Cynthia. I didn't mind, though, because there was no one else around but the station agent, and he was eating his lunch and didn't notice. There was a kind of parade when I got back to Freedom, and they had me ride down the street in the Chipigny's truck, and there was a big sign on the grocery store that said, Welcome home, Nate Twitchell, on it. And the school band played some music, all five of them marching together in front of the truck. The parade went all the way up to the schoolhouse, and Mr. Jenkins came out and very kindly handed me my school books, even though I wasn't in any great hurry about them, and I could have easily waited until the next day. Then the parade turned around and came back to our house. As soon as the truck stopped, I got down, because I felt pretty foolish up there with everybody looking at me, though I liked it, too, in a way. Mom and Cynthia had a table out in front of the house, and they served cider and donuts to the whole crowd. It was one of those terrific days that you get sometimes up here in October. The sky was so blue you could hardly believe it, and everywhere you looked you could see all those bright red and yellow leaves against the sky. It looked as if nature had put everything she had into making one really perfect day. Even the smells were perfect. A mixture of smoke from across the street, and that dry smell of leaves on the ground, and the smell of warm grass and dirt in the sunshine, and just on the edge of it all, the faintest whiff of sweet cider. The excitement died down pretty fast, and the next day I went to school, and I had to study subjects and predicates and fractions just as if I'd never been away at all. And now one day goes along pretty much like another, and there's not much excitement. There's plenty to do, though, what with laying in the stove wood for the winter and taking care of the goat and the chickens. It gets dark out by supper time now, and we sit around the stove evenings, and the warmth feels good. Once a week, though, a letter comes from Dr. Zimmer down in Washington. He keeps me posted on how Uncle Beasley is coming along. The latest letter I had said that he was almost 20 feet long and weighed 13,900 pounds. The doctor said that Uncle Beasley was not growing so fast now, and that probably meant he wasn't a baby anymore, and he could take his time about reaching his full size. He still has another few feet to add to his length, Dr. Zimmer wrote, and another three tons to his weight, but he probably won't be full grown for 50 years, and he may live for a hundred years after that. If all goes well, your little pet will be an ornament to the National Zoological Park for a long, long time. He is eating well, about 400 pounds of feed a day, but we don't need to worry about the expense. Visitors have contributed $240,271.31 by closing time today, January 28th, and money is still coming in fast. Even if we have no more contributions from now on, the dinosaur's food bill is paid all the way through 1996. And if the Congress threatens to get rid of him then, you could come down and make another speech for us. So, I guess the wonderful American dinosaur is safe for a while anyway. Well, I guess that's about the end of the story. After cold weather settled in, 
Pop suggested that I ought to write it all down in a sort of a book, and so I did. I wrote some I wrote some every evening after supper at the kitchen table, and it used up the most tremendous pile of paper, and it was an awful lot of work, and I'm glad it's all over. Pop says I better not show it to Miss Watkins, or I'd be writing out spelling mistakes until I'm old enough to vote. Miss Watkins is my teacher, and she gets pretty worked up about spelling and commas and things like that. We never got in our camping trip to Fraconia Notch, but Mom thinks maybe we could go to Washington during the spring vacation. I could show them all the sights, but most of the time I want to be up at the zoo, keeping up my friendship with Uncle Beasley. And if you're in Washington, D.C. in the spring, and if you happen to go into the elephant house and look in the dinosaur cage and see a boy in there with the triceratops and talking to him, and maybe even riding on his back, you can be pretty sure that boy will be me.